lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. The Nazarenes are essentially a sect of Methodists. When mainstream Methodism became theologically liberal, the Nazarenes, following someone called Phineas Brzee, wanted to take a more conservative line and tried to remain loyal to the original ideas of John Wesley. Now, they did this not only doctrinally and theologically, but they imitated Wesley's emphasis on home missions, on missions in the inner city, beginning in Los Angeles. The Nazarenes also uh, became a force to be reckoned with in, in Great Britain and established various Bible colleges and things of that nature. A Nazarene is essentially a conservative Methodist. Unfortunately, in recent decades, they've become more and more liberal theologically. There are still believers among them, but one of their leaders, the illustrious Mr. Kent, unfortunately signed evangelicals and Catholics together, something that Phineas Brzee or John Wesley never would have done. The problem that the Nazarenes had was their rule book. They were people who confused holiness with a soft legalism or nomianism. They had a rule book the size of the Manhattan Yellow Pages. You can't, again, go to the circus because the girls who ride the elephants have skimpy costumes, something we've dealt with on other, other film clips where legalism becomes confused with holiness. If you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. They got so much into the rule keeping, a la the Sanhedrin, that it became the oral law to them, and they began to gravitate further away from the word of God. You had people like Michael Christensen within the Church of the Nazarene that went into a direction that I can only describe as apostate, something the early Nazarenes never would have believed. John Wesley wrote a book, The Plain Account of Christian Perfection, and in many ways it's a good book. But extrapolating from Wesley, not going by what Wesley said, the Nazarenes began to equate baptism of the Holy Spirit with quote-unquote entire sanctification. That is sinless perfection. Now, we should point out that there are Pentecostal sects that uh, are also holiness that do similar things, um, but they're not the Church of the Nazarene. It's not only the Nazarenes who do this. I simply focus on the Nazarenes because you've asked about them. Now, I point out I've known a number of Nazarene missionaries in the Middle East and in other countries who were good and godly men. There's no question about this. I've also known some of their leaders over the years, such as E.B. Lewis. They were good and godly men. They were not caught up in this intricate system of legalism. But unfortunately, many Nazarenes were. They published a magazine called Heralds of Holiness. They did something Wesley never did while claiming to be Wesleyan. Again, equating spirit baptism with entire sanctification, that is, sinless perfection. It is true to say that the Holy Spirit empowers us to lead holy and moral lives. But looking at that text in 1 John, we have to understand something. The Greek language is not the same as the English language. The Greek language tells us this sin is better translated as a participle sinning. That is to say, it's present continuous active. Not that believers don't sin, but believers don't live in or practice sin habitually. In other words, we drop our crosses. A backslider is somebody who throws his cross away. A believer is somebody who drops his cross, picks it up, and keeps going. This is not to say that believers don't sin. It is just to say, one, we don't have to, and two, if we do, we have an advocate with the Father. That is Jesus the righteous. The text draws a distinction between sinning and continuing to sin, living in sin. Barnabas and Peter, we're told in Galatians, were both guilty of a discriminatory hypocrisy. 
that that had a uh, uh, connotation that went against what the Holy Spirit showed the apostles doctrinally in Acts 15 when they wouldn't eat with Gentiles because they wanted to look good, so they alienated themselves from their Gentile brethren. And Paul publicly confronted them and even mentioned Barnabas by name. What Peter and Barnabas did was wrong. It was contrary to what the Holy Spirit had showed the church in Acts 15. It was a lack of love towards the brethren. Anything not done in faith is sin. Are we going to say that Peter and Barnabas were not saved? They did not have sinless perfection? No. Believers do sin. But we do not live in sin. We do not practice sin habitually. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. He empowers us to live a moral life. And when we do fall, he empowers us to repent, to pick up our cross, and continuing to follow Jesus. When I got saved, there were radical changes in my life. I stopped taking cocaine and, and cannabis and illegal drugs, but I was strung out on cocaine as a kid. I stopped sleeping around. I stopped these things. There were things in my life that the Lord delivered me from all at once, like cigarette smoking and cocaine. Okay. There were other things that took the Lord a longer time to deal with, and there are things in my life and in your life he's still dealing with. We look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham was the Yedida, the friend of God. Yet, there were things in his life that God was dealing with even into old age, as would be true of the other patriarchs, Isaac and Jacob. Remember, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only for certain people at certain times. Patriarchs, high priests, kings, prophets, and judges. David had the Holy Spirit, and his repentance prayer in Psalm 51 was, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. But he had the Spirit, yet he sinned. King Saul had the Spirit, yet he sinned. What was the difference? David repented. Saul did not. Another example, of course, a believer who continues to battle with a particular sin is Samson. But ultimately, Samson was saved. He just bought something on himself God would have spared him from. And believers who do not yield to the Lord when he wants to deal with sinful areas of our life can go the way of Samson. I would refer you to the teaching, Moriel teaching, Mezuzot, Mezuzot, dealing with Samson. So, in specific response to your question, <coughs> what the Apostle John is talking about is not that believers don't sin but they don't live in it. They don't practice it. The Lord's not finished with us yet. But remember, my favorite verse in the New Testament, he who began a good work in you will bring it to the completion in the day of Christ Jesus. This is not to say the sin is not serious. It cost Jesus his life, and it will cause the correction of God in our life if necessary. But it is to say, the Word of God draws a distinction between dropping our crosses and throwing them away. I hope this clarifies matters. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless.